Let's go ahead and stand together, take our hymn books. Let's turn to page number 77. Page number 77, crown him with many crowns. One hundred and eighty two, my Savior's love. Smile. 
the seed tonight, so thank you for our Savior's love. Uh, to think that he would love a sinner like you and like I. That's incredible to think about what amazing love that is. I love John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And what did he give? The very best that he had, he gave his son, Jesus Christ. And so thankful for Jesus being the way, the truth and the life, and us having eternal life through him. So good to see you tonight. And uh, how many of you got your uh, afternoon nap in? A couple of us. How many of you didn't need one? Okay, how many of you are waiting till the service gets into full? <laughs> Sandy, don't even. That's not even good. <laughs> All right, well, so we need to pray for Sandy here. And uh, Karen, you might have to give her a little nudge every once in a while there to make sure she's still going. Let's bow for prayer as we begin tonight. Uh, Phil Townley, would you open our service in prayer, please? And would you turn to page 310? Page 310, The Solid Rock. tonight. We make our way back to our seats. We'll pick up on that third verse of page 310. Oh 
seated and uh, I'm going to ask if you would uh, begin to prepare for our offering men if you want to prepare as well we make a couple of announcements as you're getting ready if you'd like to give towards uh, brother Farnham uh, and his ministry uh, be sure and designate that on an offering envelope so thankful for his uh, ministry with us uh, today and looking forward to the message this evening let me remind you about just kind of the, the week that we've got coming up here tonight following the service we'll have a, bri a light a light up meal afterwards, so I encourage you to stick around for some fellowship uh, after the service here. Be right here in the fellowship hall. There's plenty of food for everybody, and we'll we'll continue that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night services. Will be at six o'clock Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Then we'll have a light fellowship or light meal to follow, and we'll try to keep the fellowship light too. I guess I don't know, but uh, looking forward to that. Be sure and be in your place this week. It's going to be a blessing and encouragement to your heart and to your soul. Uh, and then also this coming weekend. Uh, ladies, we have our ladies luncheon, so all moms, daughters, uh, uh, and uh, ladies, you are welcome to be a part of that. Uh, be sure and sign up uh, in, the, in the foyer there so, so the ladies who are preparing the food and that will have an accurate representation of who's all going to be there. Uh, and then there will also be, uh, you'll be revealed, I think your pr secret prayer pals will be revealed, I believe, uh, during that luncheon, and you'll get new ones for the next year. Uh, and so Ingrid would, would like you to fill out another sheet uh, uh, with, uh, with your likes, dislikes, and all that kind of stuff, I guess, and uh, uh, fill that out and then give that back to her. We'll have all that set for you uh, on Saturday. And then on Sunday, it's Mother's Day. All moms in attendance will have a special gift for each mom that is present. And so be sure and be in your place this coming Sunday uh, as well. And then I know this is just a little bit out. We're going to have our quarterly business meeting on May, Sunday, May the 19th, be following the evening service. And uh, the, big, the big thing we're looking at is uh, sealing the parking lot, striping that. And so we've gotten several quotes on that. Uh, and so we want to present that to the church body. We'll get it striped, and so we'll have a parking, kind of a organized parking in that. As we grow, as God blesses and people come, uh, we're, we've run out of room in our parking lot. So we want to make good use of the space that we have. Uh, and so this striping will help us with that. And I think uh, the current plan was at 52 spots, something like that is what we've got, uh, which is quite a bit in here. And so we're excited about that, getting that a little bit organized and make that a little easier for everybody. But we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that uh, next Sunday, give you some more information next Sunday on that. And then we'll be voting on that on the 19th. And so excited about that. And then down the road, I know we're just now into, into May, uh, but we've got Memorial Day coming up. We'll have our Memorial Day picnic. Uh, and uh, we'll have an afternoon service. There's also, we'll have a cornhole tournament that day as well. So I want to encourage you to invite somebody to join you. Maybe say, hey, be on my cornhole team. Uh, invite them to church, and we'll give the gospel and, uh, and excited about that opportunity. So have, have somebody join you for services on Memorial Day weekend there. All right, young men, if you would come, we'll receive our offering tonight. Continue to give as you're able, as God has blessed. And then if you, once again, would like to give to Brother Farnham and his ministry, uh, be sure and designate that on an offering envelope. Stephen, would you ask the Lord's blessing on the offering tonight?
Would you take your hymn books? Let's turn to page 478. 478, I need the every hour. say that even this hour that we have together, we need the Lord. We need the Lord to keep us free from distraction, keep us focused on Him, upon His Word. And uh, I want the Holy Spirit to speak to my heart and trust that uh, that's your desire for your life as well. And so let's pray, uh, and then Brother Farnham will come and preach for us tonight. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, once again that we can, for the privilege of once again hearing your Word proclaimed this evening. God, I pray that you'd use Brother Farnham in a unique way tonight. Uh, God, speak through him. And, and God, may we be willing to listen and yield to your Holy Spirit's leading. God, that song, just I need thee every hour, I think it, it applies to every moment of our life. But tonight, as we hear your word proclaimed, God, I pray that you would keep us focused on you, that God, you would speak to our hearts, uh, that God, we would walk away from this place changed, that God, we'd be more in love with you and better equipped to serve you. God, we love you. Bless these next few moments together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brother Farm's going to come preach for us tonight. Listen carefully. All right. Thank you, Pastor Nieder. And let's find the book of Acts tonight. If you have your Bible with you, and I hope you'll bring your Bible, each of these services, and uh, bring the Word of God with you, carry it with you, have a copy of it with you at all times. It's a wonderful thing to have. And... Um, out on the book table, I just want to call your attention to a CD that is out there. And some of you may remember uh, that in the fall of uh, 2018, uh, a family, the Wesco family, went to the country of Cameroon. And uh, 12 days after they arrived on the field, uh, the husband was shot in the head by a stray bullet from street fighting. And uh, he died right there in the vehicle next to his wife and their second son. Uh, the U.S. Embassy got them out of the country of Cameroon, got them back in the country here, and they spent some time, of course, grieving, and then they traveled and ministered to a lot of broken people, and one of the things they did was make a CD. Mrs. Wesco is an accomplished pianist and a songwriter, and uh, so she has put together a CD with a number of original songs, along with some songs that have been written by others she, as a widow, and her children sing on this CD. And it's beautiful, beautiful music. Perhaps you know somebody who is going through a deep valley uh, of one kind or another, and that CD could be a real help and a real encouragement. That is out there. 
Another book that is out there is entitled Your Creator's Design, and this is my latest book, and uh, basically dealing with the subject of the will of God. And it's a book I recommend for uh, people who are making decisions, uh, important decisions, uh, decisions like what college do I attend or do I attend college, uh, decisions like what person do I marry or uh, should I get married, uh, decisions about uh, the major issues of life and uh, what, do you, what, what does God want you to do with your life. So that book is out there as well, Your Creator's Design. It's interesting that we as independent Baptists are, <coughs> excuse me, very focused on the fact that we have a creator. We are very much against the evolutionary model of the origins of the earth. We're very much against evolution as the reasoning behind uh, what we see on this planet, and yet we get very possessive of our own plans and our own lives. And the God who created each one of us designed us to do his bidding, to do his will. And he has a specific plan for every single human being that he has ever created. And so I, I identify that in that book. Acts chapter 16 tonight. <coughs> I appreciate your prayers for my wife. A number of you have uh, assured me that you're praying for her, and I appreciate that so much. Acts chapter 16, we'll begin the reading tonight in verse 12. Where the Bible says, And from thence to Philippi, so in other words, Paul was traveling city to city, um, moving from one place to another, uh, preaching the gospel, and so, he sent, and so from thence, uh, which would have been the city of Neapolis, mentioned at the end of verse 11, to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days, and on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was want, W-O-N-T, want, to be made. It means where prayer was habitually made. The W-O-N-T word means a habit. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto those things which were spoken of Paul. And when, he had, and when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, uh, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, being grieved, <coughs> excuse me, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them unto the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, these men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately <coughs> excuse me, the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed, and the, keepers of the and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, 
what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now if you'll keep your finger here in the book of Acts and find the book of Philippians. Find the book of Philippians, if you will. And we want to read a few verses there. Paul was in the city of Philippi in Acts chapter 16. And so the book of Philippians is written many years later to the church that was planted in that city uh, in Acts chapter 16. Notice as Paul opens the book of Philippians, in the early verses he says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. And so we have here, as I said, the story in the book of Acts, the record of Paul arriving in the city of Philippi, and the, the record of Paul preaching the word of God, the record of people being saved, the record of, of a church being planted, and then we have in the book of Philippians uh, the testimony that that church actually was planted, and that church grew, and Paul writes a letter, and he addresses that letter in Philippians chapter 1, to the, to the uh, bishops and the deacons, but he also addresses it to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi. And if you go to, uh, you know, to study the whole book of Philippians, you'll find out that it is a, an epistle written to the believers and to that body of Christ. Uh, we are talking this week about faith. We're talking about our families and we're talking about culture. And I want you to understand, as I said this morning, I hinted at it, that every generation has a culture. And, uh, you know, if you were to look at one of these uh, um, things that you can find on the Internet, you know, styles of the 20s, styles of the 30s, styles of the 40s, you'll notice that culture changes, and culture has changed tremendously. However, uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Malachi, the Lord speaking, Behold, I am the Lord. I what? I change not. And you come to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. In fact, you may sing that song here, yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. And so we have a God who never changes, but we have a world that is continuously changing. And because we have a God that never changes, and we live in a world that is continuously changing, we have to decide whether we're going to adapt to the world or whether we are going to conform to Jesus Christ. And everybody has to make that decision. And this generation is no different than any other generation. We have to determine whether we are going to love the world or whether we're going to love the Lord. We have to decide uh, today, tomorrow, the next day, next week, next month, we must make a decision. Am I going to live my life by Scripture, which we believe as inspired as well as preserved, or am I going to live my life by culture? Am I going to live my life and when, when culture makes a change, then I will adapt to that. And when culture makes another change, I will adapt to that. And when culture makes another change, and I'll just keep adapting and I'll keep changing the, the way I live and I'll keep changing the things I do and I'll keep changing the way I talk and I'll keep changing the way I dress and I'll keep, I'll just, everything that the world does around me, I'll just make sure that I can fit in because 
that's the only way to reach anybody, right? Well, why don't we talk to Lot for a minute and find out how many people we win when we conform to a wicked culture. Abraham stands with God on the night before Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboim and the cities of the plain were destroyed in a fiery judgment from God. And he stands there and he prays and he says, Lord, if there be 50 righteous in the city, uh, w- w- would you spare the city? Would you spare the place for 50 righteous? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? It, it doesn't seem right to me, Abraham said to the Lord, that, that you would destroy the righteous with the wicked. And the Lord said to Abraham, if I find 50 righteous in the city, I'll spare the whole place for 50 righteous. And Abraham is thinking, and he said, well, what about 45? And the Lord said, I'll spare it for 45. And what about 40? And what about 30? And what about 20? And he keeps going down and keeps going down and he keeps going down. And finally he says to the Lord, uh, you know, it's almost like he's apologizing to the Lord. He said, I, I, I'm, I, I've taken it upon myself to talk to you. What if, Lord, what if you find only 10 righteous in the city? You know what the Lord said? He said, if I find 10 righteous in the city, I'll spare the whole place. But he didn't find 10 righteous in the city. Because people who conform to culture do not win others to Christ. Let me say that again. People who conform to culture do not win others to Christ. We have a man by the name of the Apostle Paul, and he is is saved in a rather dramatic conversion experience on the Damascus Road and in the city of Damascus as Ananias uh, comes and witnesses to him and speaks to him. And the scales fall off his eyes that had been there for a few days, and, and he looks upon Ananias, he rises, he's baptized, and he begins immediately preaching the message of the gospel. He begins preaching it so clearly and so avidly that it isn't long before he's driven out of the city of Damascus. He did not try to conform to the people in Damascus. No, he was now determined to conform to Jesus Christ. He ends up in Jerusalem. Same thing happens there. And everywhere Paul went, there was either a revival or a riot and sometimes both. Because Paul did not swallow the mindset that if we conform to the culture, we'll reach more people. And when it started happening in the 1980s in what we call the New Evangelical Movement, we watched people flock to these non-doctrinal churches by the thousands. And the numbers of our independent Baptist churches began to dwindle. And so, you know what we did? We said, oh, well, they still have big crowds. So if we're going to reach anybody, we have to be like the world. And now we see what that's doing to us. And so I want to give you some things tonight from the book of Acts. And I want you to see, number one, the culture of Philippi. In Acts chapter 16, we find Philippi was a city of importance. In verse 12, notice the Bible says it's the chief city uh, of that part of Macedonia. It's a city of importance. Notice it was called a colony, and the Greek word here for colony uh, means that it was, a, it was a harbor city. It was a city where the Roman government had set up housing for its army veterans. And so it was a city of some means. It was a, it was a chief city. And then you can find it was a city of business. In verse 14, we find this woman named Lydia, a seller of purple uh, in the city of Thyatira. And purple dye was a very valuable commodity in those days. Purple dye, purple being the color of royalty. And so this woman had a rather uh, lucrative business. And so it was a chief city. It was an important city. It was a business center. It was also a city of paganism. It was a city of paganism. And you can, uh, you can uh, know that because the Romans uh, worshipped a whole panoply of gods. Uh, when Paul gets to Athens, which is the, uh, the chief city of the Greek culture, uh, he says you're so superstitious that you even have a, an altar to the unknown god. 
You know, you're, you're, you're afraid you're going to miss one. And so uh, Paul is dealing with an, a, a culture that is pagan. And I don't know, I, I don't know if, if we are really, really, really ready to admit to the paganism of the United States of America. You know, we still had people talking about uh, America being a Christian nation. If you call exalting sodomy Christianity, this is not a Christian nation. If you, if you are going to stand by while, while people in government, people sitting on the Supreme Court, people in high places, are ad, uh, they're, not just, they're not just acknowledging, they're advocating this non-scientific, completely insane business of transgenderism. It's insanity. You know, I, I remember just three years ago when all the liberals were telling us to follow the science. Remember that? Well, you know, if you're a male in here, the science tells me that you have an X and a Y chromosome, not just, you know, one set of them. In every one of the trillion cells in your body, there is an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and that's what makes you a man. And you know what? You can have a thousand operations, but you cannot replace every cell in your body, and you're still going to be of the male gender. And if you're a woman here tonight, uh, you, you have two X chromosomes. And it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how many hormones you take, it doesn't matter how much therapy you submit yourself to, we are living in a day and time when people are going to tell you you can be something else. No, you can't be, because you can't replace every cell in your body. And, and we are living in a, it's utter paganism. I, I want you to think back and how many millions of babies this country has aborted. That's paganism. That is offering the children of the womb to some devil. Listen, it takes two murderers to perform an abortion. One mother and one doctor. It is a travesty. And this was a pagan culture where Paul went. We sometimes look around and we say, oh, the world is so gone mad. We just, you know what, we just got to hang on. We can't do anything. You know, the world around us just, you know, it's just so bad. Well, here is this girl in verse 16, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. I want to harp on this, but I want to make note of a word here, a spirit of divination. The Bible never uses the word demon. Demon is a Roman Catholic word. It is not a Bible word. The Bible speaks of spirits and devils. Never do you find the word demon in your King James Bible. Now you can find it in other Bibles that have been corrupted, but the word devils is what the Bible speaks of. Unclean spirits, deaf spirits, dumb spirits, uh, evil spirits, and this girl was possessed by a spirit of divination. You notice what she said? It's interesting what she said. These men verse 17, are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now I want to ask you, was what she said true? Were Paul and Silas the servants of the Most High God? Yes or no? And, and were they showing the city the way of salvation? Yes or no? Yeah, but she was possessed by a devil. And it's very interesting, the devil knows what to say, and he knows how to say it. And I think this is a verse that would illustrate for us how that paganism can take over, and sometimes paganism sounds very biblical. No wonder Jesus said, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. We live in a pagan country. There's no question that the United States has stooped to paganism in many, many, many areas. All right, let's move on. It was a city of corruption. In verses 19 to 22, the masters of this girl who had been uh, given this uh, devil who could, who, uh, who could predict the future, um, they saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They had hired this girl. They had purchased this girl, and, and they were making money off from her. And when they saw that the hope of their gains was gone, verse 19, they found Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace, brought them to the magistrates, 
said that these people are exceedingly troubling our city, which they weren't. They were actually trying to preach the gospel to redeem that city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, etc. And the multitude, verse 22, rose up together to get against them, and the magistrates ripped off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Now, I, wanna, I want you to tell, some, tell you something. Roman law forbade the open beating of a Roman citizen. And Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. But you know what? Uh, we're going to find out in the United States, if things continue the way they are, that there are rights given to only certain citizens. That's what we're going to find out. And we're going to discover that we live uh, just like they did in a city of corruption, where there's no real justice. The justice is meted out for those who agree with the culture. But anybody who wants to stand up for Scripture may actually have to pay a price in order to do so. We may be coming to that. That may be happening within the lifetimes of the people here. And you know what's interesting? If we don't want somebody to laugh at us because we were, we're trying to be modest in an immodest world, it's unlikely that we're going to take a stand for Jesus Christ if we're threatened with prison. If we can't take it when someone laughs at us, we're probably not going to go to prison for our faith. You know, we're, 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 we're in a time when we need to really be thinking about that. We really do. Notice it was also a city of harshness. In Acts chapter 16, verse 24, this jailer thrust them into the inner prison, made their feet fast in the stocks. And so I want you to see tonight that the culture into which Paul went, city after city after city, was very much like the culture of the United States of America, minus the modern conveniences. They didn't have automobiles. They didn't have jet travel. They, they didn't have global warming because, you know, we weren't putting too much carbon dioxide into the air, you know. And that's another false science. No, and, and what I want you to see is not only do we see the culture here, but we see the faith. Look, look, at, look in verse uh, 14, uh, here in Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Notice the Bible says, certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, <coughs> heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, so that she attended unto those things which were spoken of Paul. So she was very likely, like Cornelius, a man of worship, a man uh, wanting to know God, and here was a, here was a woman who who had some reverence for God. She was open to these things. And as Paul preached the gospel, her heart opened. And because she had an open heart, God opened her heart and she attended. That is, she gave attention and she gave, uh, she gave credibility to those things that Paul spoke. You know what? There are people in the United States of America who are looking for an answer. There are people in the United States of America, despite our culture, who want to know how to be saved. Several months ago, I was traveling here in the state of Michigan, and uh, I had to leave very early in the morning because I had just a Sunday meeting, and they wanted me to fill pulpit for the, the pastor who was away, and, and so I got up fairly early. It was just a, a short drive from our house, not, not quite this far away. And uh, on the way up, I stopped... Uh, for breakfast at Bob Evans. And I, I go there for the coffee. It's excellent coffee. And um, so I pull in there and I have my breakfast and I go up to the counter and there's uh, a young lady waiting on the customers. And when it was my turn in line, I uh, handed her my check, reached in my pocket, pulled out a gospel tract. And while she's ringing me up, I said, I noticed her name. Her name was Gracie. And I remember that because it was spelled G-R-A-Y-C-I-E, different spelling. And I said, Gracie, I said, I want to give you this flyer. I said, it's a gospel tract. And I said, inside is a message from the Bible, how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. Tears welled up in this young woman's eyes. They didn't flow down her cheek, but her eyes filled up with tears. She said, I have wanted to know ever since I was a little girl how to go to heaven. 
I said, well, this flyer will teach you that. I said, I want you to read it tonight when you get off work this afternoon, whenever your shift ends. She said, I will. Several months later, I was going through that area again, and I thought, Gracie. And I realized, this is the exit. That's where this Bob Evans is. So I jumped off the highway. I thought, okay, my excuse is I'm going to go in there and buy a cup of coffee. And sure enough, Gracie was working the counter. She got me my coffee, and I said, Gracie, I said, um, several weeks ago I was in here, and I said, I handed you a little gospel tract. Do you remember that? She said, I do. I said, did you read that tract? She said, I did. And she said, I prayed the prayer at the end. I said, did you trust Christ as your Savior? She said, I did. Now, I want you to know something. There are still people like that. There are still people like Lydia. There are still people who are caught up. And you know, sometimes we find someone who's devil-possessed and we, uh, we maybe the devil that's possessing that person isn't as friendly as the devil that was possessing this girl, uh, this girl that had the spirit of divination. Maybe that devil is a mean devil. Maybe it's a, an unclean devil. Maybe it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a devil of, of evil intentions and so on. And, and we get around people. And you know, if you're sensitive to the Lord at all, you'll be sensitive when the devil's present. You'll know it. And you know what we do? Ooh. Oh, my goodness. Well, they need the gospel too. And you know, there are people like that in the United States who want to be saved. There are people who have given themselves over to the devil. Maybe they were playing the Ouija board. Maybe they were playing Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe they were messing around. Maybe someone invited them to a seance. Maybe they have a family member who's a, quote, white witch. Maybe they have uh, someone in the family who worships the devil and that person influences them. And they get into something and they don't want to be in it anymore. You know, there's such a thing as a person actually desiring to hear the word of the Lord. There's such a thing in a wicked, evil culture that the gospel can penetrate I think we sang the song this morning, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. And you know what? What, is that, what does that third stanza say? Reaching the who? The most defiled. Do we really believe that as a church? Because if we do, we're going to not back away. We're not going to shy away from people in our culture who may be like Lydia with an open heart, but they might be like this damsel. They might be possessed by the devil. They might be somebody who's hired by the corrupt system, somebody who hurls prisoners into an inner prison, slams their backs that have been beaten raw by, by Roman soldiers who had no right to do what they did, slammed their backs up against the wall, made their feet fast in the stocks, you know, there might be somebody out there that's just mean and hateful and hired by the system, hired by the government. But then again, we've been taught so long separation of church and state, which is a completely non-constitutional statement. Those words aren't found in the Constitution. They're found in letters written by Baptists in the state of Virginia, I believe, I think it was in Virginia. It's not part of the Constitution at all. And it's all built on a farce. It's a lie. It's a, it's a patent lie that our government has spread around and built case after case and precedent after precedent on the constitutional guarantee of separation of church and state, and it's not in there. Get your own copy of the Constitution. You will not find the phrase separation of church and state in the Constitution of the United States. It's not there. It's not in the Bill of Rights. What the Bill of Rights guarantees is that you may worship the Lord and you may not be prosecuted for it. But who's reading the Constitution? And who's following it? No, we want to follow the science when it works for us, but when it doesn't work for us, we're going to disregard that too. But you see, there is culture, but there's faith. And I want you to see that in this chapter, three key people of totally different backgrounds trusted Christ. An unnamed jailer 
an unnamed damsel who had been possessed with a spirit of divination, and a businesswoman named Lydia. And now we know that there were several other people. If you uh, hold your finger here and we go over to the book of Philippians, we find out there were some other people. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> Paul says, I beseech Euodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. If you're to go to the end of this chapter, you will see here all the saints salute you, verse 22, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So what we find out is that there were people uh, who were saved in the city of Philippi, and now Paul is sending greetings to them and sending instructions to them. And so what we find here is that Paul goes to Philippi but years and years and years pass, and now he sends a letter to them, and the church is still there. The church didn't die when Paul left town. What a glorious thought. That culture can be overcome by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if I were to ask tonight for a raise of hands of how many of you are saved, I assume on a Sunday night most hands would go up, other than perhaps some of the much younger children. Everybody here who is an adult, I'm assuming, would raise a hand and say, yes, I'm saved. I know the Lord as my Savior. Do you realize that that faith is to give us power to overcome our culture, not power to conform to it? And so we have faith here, we have culture here, but notice the family. It's interesting. In, in verse 14 and 15, <coughs> a certain woman named Lydia, we see there in verse 14, and the Bible says that she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul, and when she was baptized and her household. So what had happened is that Paul had come to her house and had preached additional truth, and she and everybody in her family had gotten saved. And here is a family of people saved in a culture that was wicked, a culture that was all money, money motivated, it was business oriented, it was pagan, it was a corrupt culture, it was a harsh culture just like ours, and in many ways, harsher than ours. And yet, people got saved, and their families got saved. Notice what the Bible says, when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there, and she constrained us. It's likely... I said, it's likely, I cannot prove it, but it is likely that the first meeting place of this baby infant church in Philippi was the house of Lydia. A prominent, wealthy woman probably had a very nice home and a spacious home, and she gave it over, very likely, to the Apostle Paul and to Silas and to their other co-workers and they used it as a center to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see that the jailer, uh, in, in verses uh, 32 and following, actually, uh, verse 31, of course, Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And what are the next three words? And thy house. So we see it again. We see another family here. We see a family. And, and so <clears throat> they spake, verse 32, unto him, the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. An amazing story. And of course, the next day, they, uh, they, Paul and Silas are dismissed because somebody found out they're Roman citizens and they're like, uh-oh, we're in trouble because we openly beat some Roman citizens. And so they, they tell him, get out of town, you know, just go away from here, leave us alone. And so uh, anyway, uh, we find out that if you read toward the end of the chapter, that, uh, 
they came and, and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. Verse 39, verse 40, they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. So they went back to the place where Lydia was. What I want you to see is, not only did individuals get saved, families got saved. And the reason families got saved is that the gospel was preached and it was not an adulterated gospel. It was not a compromised gospel. It was not a diluted gospel. It was not a dissolving gospel. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ that requires people to absolutely renounce their pagan wicked ideas. Do you realize that you cannot continue believing things that send people to hell and expect to go to heaven? You realize that? You cannot say, well, you know what, I, I, I believe in Jesus, but, you know, I'm a good person. No, nobody's a good person. And when you're resting on your own goodness, you're not resting on Jesus alone. You can't put your goodness up on the cross beside Jesus Christ and say, I'll trust Jesus and my goodness. I'll trust Jesus and the commandments that I keep. I'll trust Jesus plus. No, there is no Jesus plus. It's Jesus only, and only Jesus. And so there, was a, there is this great, great thing. Now, I want to do some takeaways here, just some thoughts. Number one, the reason, or excuse me, the method we use to reach these sinners is the preaching of the gospel. And when Paul gets to the book of Philippi, uh, the book of Philippians, he tells them, he is speaking to them, and he mentions in chapter 1, verse 5, their fellowship in the gospel. Their fellowship, where was it? It was in the gospel. It was in the message of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. It was in the message of the blood. We sang about that this morning. It was in the message of grace. We sang about that this morning. Wonderful grace of Jesus. It was the message that we must preach. And we cannot water it down. We can't make it easy. And we can't just tell everybody, oh, listen, Jesus loves everybody. Just, just bow your head, say this prayer. No, it's interesting to me, Lydia attended to those things which were spoken. She was interested. She was wanting something. The, the Philippian jailer comes and falls down on the floor in front of Paul and Silas and says, what must I do to be saved? When Peter preached on Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? There was a, there was a, a terror in their hearts that if they didn't know the right answer, they'd die and go to hell. You know, it's interesting to me, there is not one place in all of the Bible where you can find one person saying a prayer and having somebody else repeat it after him. There is not a single place in the Bible where we find that. We find people hearing the gospel and they are so convicted, and they are so drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if a person cannot call on the name of the Lord, he may need to hear the gospel again. I am thankful that when somebody was witnessing to me all those 49 and a half years ago now, that she didn't just say, look, you know what, I, I, I get it that you don't understand this. I get it that this is all foreign to you. Just bow your head and pray this prayer, and I'll say the prayer, and you repeat it after me. It would have meant nothing to me. It would have meant absolutely nothing to me because I was an atheist. It took time for the word of God and the verses that she gave. And one of the things we need to do is remember that soul winning is not McDonald's Christianity. You know, we don't drive up to the drive through and give the gospel at one window and win the soul at the next window. It might take six months. It might take five years. I was in a testimony meeting just recently and a woman raised her hand with tears in her eyes. She said, I want to testify. This week, I finally led one of my friends to Christ. I've been witnessing to her for over 20 years. Sometimes that's what it takes. Because they didn't all get saved the first day Paul went to Philippi. But by the time he writes a letter to them, there's a whole church there. 
because individuals get saved and families get saved and families reach other people and other people reach other people and that is the way it works. And it isn't the fault of culture if we're not reaching sinners. Because it's the culture to whom we are sent. It's not their fault that we aren't reaching them. It is, it is upon us. The responsibility rests with us. I want you to see this. Uh, they, they obeyed in baptism and church, church membership and discipleship. They grew. Philippians 1.8 says, for God is, or verse 7, excuse me, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all, you all are partakers of my grace. What is the confirmation of the gospel? It is the fact that once these people were saved, they grew. They proved the reality of the gospel. Do you know how we prove the reality of the gospel? You know how we confirm the gospel? You know how we make the message of the gospel to be firmer and firmer and firmer in the eyes of other people? Well, God changes our lives. All of us know somebody that got saved and nothing ever really happened. And so when you talk to somebody about that person, you say, well, he says he's saved. Well, she claims to be saved, but there's no fruit and there's no growth. We all know people like that. But the confirmation of the gospel is that not only are they saved, but they're baptized and they grow and they develop and, and they, they learn things. We, we see that growth in Philippians 1 verse 12. Paul says, I would, have, I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So, so Paul tells that the things happened to him uh, resulted in the gospel going further, not, not coming in and, and, and huddling in and saying, well, you know what, uh, things are pretty bad out there. We better hunker down and, and put bars on the windows to, 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 ke to keep the church safe. No, the gospel went farther. And the things that had happened to Paul were beatings and shipwrecks and stonings and all kinds of things. And he went through those things for the cause of Christ. He didn't go through those things to be a martyr. He went through those things for the glory of Jesus Christ. We see growth in verse 17 of this chapter. Uh, the, he speaks there of the defense of the gospel. You know what? It, 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 it's important that we learn how to do that. It is important that we learn how to defend the gospel. It is important that we learn. Now, I'm not saying if you're seven years old, you ought to be able to debate uh, an atheist who's studied uh, world religions for 42 years. But you know what? Those of us that have been saved for years and years and years, we ought to know how to defend the gospel. We ought to be Bible students. We ought to be growing, confirming the gospel, defending the gospel. And notice what he says in verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And so the more we live, the more we develop, the more our lifestyle, the more our entire being is just a gospel advertisement for the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day of our lives, we ought to be more and more and more entrenched in the Bible. Every day of my life, every day of your life. Don't worry about the, don't worry about the culture. Invest yourself in the scripture. Now, I'm not going to ask tonight for a raise of hands. How many of you read the Bible every year? Or how many of you read the Bible twice a year? Or how many of you read the Bible five times a year? I'm not going to ask that. I'm not going to ask tonight uh, for people to stand up and say, you know, how much time do you invest reading the Bible every day? I'm not going to ask that. But if the average adult is awake for 16 to 17 hours a day, if you read the Bible for an entire hour every day, that is a mere 6% of your waking life. That's an entire hour of Bible reading. If you read the Bible for 30 minutes a day, now we're down to 3% of your waking life. But if you do what a lot of people that I know do, and you read the Bible for 10 minutes a day, you realize you're giving God 
of your time to get to know him? Just 1% of your waking life. And part of our problem today is we're illiterate in the scripture. Our lives don't confirm the gospel. We can't defend the gospel because we're not familiar with it. We're not fluent in it. We can't find our way in the Word of God. And that isn't the fault of the people out there who want to ask the stump the chump questions. That is our fault if we are not students of the Bible. And it's our fault if we are not men and women of prayer. And it is on us to go back to what they did in the Bible they reached their generation. Jesus used the, the writer Mark, and I'll be done here in just a moment. Jesus used the gospel writer Mark to give us these words. Go ye into all the world, that phrase, all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. And, and if you'll go with me tonight, we're, we're going to just go over to the book of Philippians, or excuse me, Colossians, the next book after Philippians. Go to the book of Colossians. And we'll just look at the first chapter for just a moment before we close. Colossians 1, let's look at verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in, what are the next three words? All the world. All the world. It's the same three English words that are in Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world. By the word, it's the exact same three Greek words in both places. Go ye into all the world. As, and it has come into you as it is in all the world. Do you realize what is, what is being said here? Between the time that Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and the years when Paul wrote the book of Colossians, the gospel had gone into all the known world. All of it. The entire world. Now, what about every creature? Well, let's go down to verse 23, same chapter. Colossians 1:23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached, what are the next three words? To every creature which is under heaven. The same three words, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, are now found in the book of Colossians, to every creature, and yes, it's the same three Greek words in the Greek text. You realize what that tells us? That tells us in spite of this awful culture into which the gospel first went forth, in spite of that, every living soul on planet Earth heard the gospel between the ascension of Christ and the end of Paul's life when he wrote the book of Colossians. 30 years. Roughly 35 years, maybe. They reached the whole world. They didn't have email. They didn't have high-speed rail. They didn't have cars. They didn't have printing presses. They didn't have gospel tracts that they could hand out on street corners by the thousand. No. They didn't have any of that. If you had a copy of the Bible, it was because somebody sat down and wrote it out for you by hand. Or you wrote out your own copy by hand. And yet they got the gospel to all the world and to every creature. And they didn't do that by conforming to the world. They didn't do that by watering down the gospel. They did that by preaching the word of God as it is here, preserved for us now in the English language, preserved for them. They had it in the Greek language. And what I want us to see tonight is that this church, sitting right here tonight, this church 
can have an impact on Grayling, Michigan. This church can have an impact on the surrounding towns. This church can have an impact, not just here and across the sea, but maybe there's a church plant going on somewhere here in Michigan or a church replant where someone is trying to reopen a closed church and maybe you can help that church and get the gospel not just in your Jerusalem but in your Judea and then maybe you can send your support to an evangelist who is traveling around and ministering in Samaria and you know what you can be a church that reaches your generation amen that is the Great Commission it's four places it's not just Jerusalem and the uttermost part of the earth. It's Judea and Samaria in the middle. That's what I do every week of the world. I travel around the Samaria of the Midwest primarily, ministering the Word of God, seeking to open the Scriptures and show people you can make an impact on your generation. Stop focusing on the culture. Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand tonight with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. We see in this passage of Scripture tonight, we see very clearly how the gospel overcame the culture, the faith of the gospel ministered to individuals and families. Now tonight, the invitation is simple. Your pastor is here at the altar praying. If I were a member of this church, I would say my pastor has a burden on his heart. I want to go down there and put my arm on his shoulder and pray with him. I want to put my arm around my pastor and say, Pastor, I'm here. Let me pray with you. If I were you tonight, I would be looking and thinking about the people in my sphere of influence that God has called you to reach. I would be thinking tonight about the people in your own workplace and in your own family who are immersed in this culture and what they need is the scripture. So as the instruments play the song that they have chosen tonight, let's do business with God. Let's find our way to the altar and bow the knee. We sing that song today, bow the knee. Are we doing that anymore? Husbands and wives, singles,
Let's sing a verse or two of Take My Life and Let It Be Together. Ben's going to come lead us. Let's sing that out together. Page 388 in your hymn books if you need it. for that message tonight. I spoke to my heart. Church family, I trust, has spoke to yours as well. There's a, we, we live in a, a, a difficult time, but it's been difficult times for thousands of years. Yeah. And so, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And that nothing catches the Lord by surprise. Uh, he's in charge. He's got a plan. Let's, let's be faithful to him. Be faithful to his plan. And that plan is for us to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let's be faithful in that. Thank you, Brother Farner, for that message. I want to encourage you tonight as we're dismissed in just a moment to be sure and check out uh, Brother Farnham's uh, book table back there. Also pick up one of his prayer cards as well. You all are invited to a meal to follow right in the fellowship hall. It'll be right out these doors and to your right. Everybody's welcome to attend. Uh, and let's just rejoice what God has done uh, in our midst here this day. And we'll look forward to gathering back again to get together tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. We'll encourage you to be back. Uh, for more preaching from the Word of God. I'm going to ask Max to come and close our service in prayer. Also ask the Lord's blessing on the food to follow. So good to see you tonight. Lord willing, we'll see you again uh, tomorrow night. Be sure to stick around for some fellowship. Let's pray. God, thank you so much um, that you are a God who saves souls. And God, not just saves souls, but as we heard this morning, that you are a God that saves lives. And God, I pray that we as a church, we as individuals, um, would not see the, the world around us and, and just see the, the problems that people have, but God, that we would see the needs that they have and uh, that we would desire to, to share your message of truth, of salvation with them before so many are looking for answers. God, thank you for that reminder again tonight. I pray that we would take it with us and that we would live it out this week. Uh, God, thank you for the food that, that you've provided for us. God, I pray that you would use it to strengthen our bodies uh, tonight. And God, I pray that we would be able to come back tomorrow night to again be encouraged from your word. Bless us as we go forth from here, I pray in your name. Amen.